innovation and entrepreneurship during the COVID pandemic. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with this concept of VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And it used to be just that, this abstract concept that was out there as a possibility, but really just more relevant to emerging markets. But with the COVID pandemic, the social unrest, all the other events of 2020, VUCA has gone from being this abstraction to, to this reality. And we've gotten a very real taste of what it means now that the pace of change is going to accelerate, um, how it's creating a, a much greater emphasis on the need for resilience and a strong immune system, both personal and organizational. And just how the nature of problems is becoming more complex, these wicked problems where there's, there's no linear one and done solution. And we're just going to have to continually manage competing demands like uh, innovation versus efficiency or performance versus human well-being. So as an executive coach, I work with tech founders and their teams, as well as military special forces to expand their capacity and evolve as leaders so they can take advantage of and capitalize on these conditions. Because... Uh, this volatility and complexity is exactly where all the opportunity lies. So today I want to draw out the stories and the examples of leadership agility, resourcefulness, all the tough decision making that our panelists have seen during the pandemic. And I hope this will do at least two things. One, it will help you extract more of the learning from your experience and then also help you identify where there might be hidden, less obvious opportunities for you going forward. So the wealth of experience and just sheer creative energy on this panel is mind boggling. So I'd really just like to dive into the conversation. I'll give a short intro of each panelist and then give them about three minutes or so to present their perspective on the past 18 months. And then we'll open it up for, for some conversation and friendly debate. So let's let's dive into round one. Um, I'd like to start with you, Anne. Um, so Anne Winblad is a pioneer in the world of technology, someone I've admired since I started working in dot coms in the late 90s. Um, and Anne started her career as a programmer at the Federal Reserve in the 70s. And then she left with three co-workers to found Open Systems, which uh, was an accounting software company. During a time, she told me, when no one believed you could make money just from software. And then six years later, in the 80s, they sold it for over $15 million. So Anne went on to co-found Hummer Winblad Venture Partners with John Hummer in 1989. And this was the first VC fund focused exclusively on software. And what I understand is the firm has since launched over 160 companies across the enterprise software sector, from business intelligence and analytics to cloud computing and security. So, Anne, you, you have this broad perspective working in tech over several decades and in software in particular. And I'm curious, what did these past 18 months look like from your vantage point? You know, what, what developments did you see or, or not see in terms of innovation and in software going digital as a result of the global pandemic? Well, I think everyone will agree that COVID was a great accelerator for digital transformation. Uh, aside from a short pause around March and April, um, everyone had to make software center stage. For the software industry as a whole, uh, user expectations got greater as software penetrated everything. Even laggard industries in the U.S. who have been software not centerpieces like education were dependent upon software. What that meant for our companies is that the customer experience had to be exceptional. The products had to work all the time. Products had to work across sectors simultaneously. We saw young companies like Zoom go to scale almost instantly. Uh, companies like Amazon, Instacart, uh, DoorDash became part of our, our life. Uh, even when we were relaxing, we were streaming media depending upon all sorts of members of the software supply chain. So for us, uh, we continued investing during that time. We saw many entrepreneurs come and pitch us brand new companies during that time. Uh, there were some things in the background that people don't realize about software. 
during that 18 months, a lot of software was getting built. If you work at Amazon, a new piece of software is being launched every three seconds, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is what it means about the pace of software innovation. Uh, at the same time, this acceleration for traditional in industries, and I'll wrap up with an example here, uh, looks like it's moving at a really significant pace. But it's, it, companies are not really thinking about what it means to rebuild themselves as software companies, what it means to not just launch a new product, but to really have a contiguous, uh, high-level customer experience. And during 2020, Porsche, for example, sold 20,000 in the U.S. of their new Taycan, a very high-end electrical car. I was one of those purchasers. I decided to buy an electrical car for the first time during uh, the COVID pandemic. The car is a beauty. It's, it's a dream. The app that tells me well, it, whether it's getting charged didn't work for a month. <laughs> Charging stations, when I went to use them, I couldn't find them because that wasn't on the app either. Once I found them, they were sort of in dark alleys and they didn't work. I had to call the company to get the chargers turned on. The, the, the company, the car needed a software upgrade. Don't you upgrade your Windows or Mac OS all the time? I had to deliver the car back to the dealer for three days, get a loaner car while they upgraded the software. 20,000 users had to do this. And just last week, the car stopped on the freeway and I brought it to the dealer. Uh, they can't fix it until they send the software logs to Germany to be analyzed. So the car has been there for a week. If we also look at the automotive industry in general, we see the supply chain uh, was not anticipated. Uh, Ford, in their earnings call, said we could make a lot more trucks had we had more semiconductors. So as we see everyone sees into this software world, this digital transformation, we really have a lot more learnings here of what the expectations are, what the expectations were of Amazon, of Zoom, of all the enterprise software that ran enterprises is the same expectation any large corporation has to have. So they are, they are the same entrepreneurs as the entrepreneurs coming to get funding from us. And they mm -hmm. have to really look at digital transformation as not just having a product that for the first time embraces software and technology, but how they really live up to the digital transfer, transformation goals that our companies had to act on during the pandemic to, to serve all of the customers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just the, how it augmented customer expectations as well in terms of accelerating change. Um, thank you, Anne. Um, Nicholas, I'd like to go to you next. Uh, Nicholas Rambus is a serial entrepreneur and an expert in data protection and privacy. He began his career as co-founder and CEO of Lobby7, an MIT mobile software spin-off backed by SoftBank. And then he went on to co-found and be the CEO of WealthX, which provides market research insights and due diligence intelligence on the ultra-affluent. He then served as general manager at Equifax until the beginning of 2020, and then dive back into the startup world co-founding and he's now the CEO of Privacy Check, a service that helps families keep their reputation and their financial, physical lives secure. So, um, Nicholas, the pandemic really showed us how exposed we are as a society in terms of our online lives, in terms of cybersecurity, identity theft, ransomware. Um, can you share your take on that and, and perhaps the story of how you, you founded or pivoted your company to address those challenges. Sure, sure, absolutely. So, you know, it's interesting, you know, hearing Ann's comments about the acceleration of digitization, you know, so, so true, but with that come some side effects, right? Uh, we've had more societal disruption in the last year, certainly from COVID, but also around the protests we see in the streets uh, and digitization, right, where we live our lives. And all that's led to technology, frankly, moving faster than people have been able to figure out its uh, unintended consequences. So now, you know, we used to say that people had digital breadcrumbs, right? Now there's a digital road of our lives really everywhere that's accessible by, by yes, ourselves and our families, but also increasing number of bad actors, right? Unemployment uh, fraud is up 3,000% year over year. Mm. It's crazy. All right, doxing as a term is now a relatively commonplace 
term, so much so that state legislators are beginning to put laws in place against it, right? So, so we had this last year and a half uh, of you know, very challenging times and events where now I think people have begun to see that the fabric, I hate to say it, of society is becoming more challenged by the day, right? There's increased wealth inequality. We see gun sales at record highs, right? So what I'd say macro level is, you know, as people, right, there's been study after study about optimism bias, right? We all sort of look at the glass half full. I think increasingly we have a generation now that will look and say, hmm, maybe I should be more concerned or worried than I have been, right? And look at uh, technology a bit more skeptically, right, than they have in the past. And so how to surmount that in this environment? And so that was really the catalyst for, well, then what do we do, right? So before I was a co-founder of an EAR trying to figure out where is the opportunity, right? What is the thing to build in this time? And so uh, I suppose we're looking on the, the crisis side, which is how do you help people? right, through this technological adolescence that was still in and have been for a while, what's the thing that you do? What's the, the service we could create? And that's how we came to to start Privacy Check. Um, so that's the, that's that sort of the view, if you will. Um, you know, I suppose I'd say this about sort of uh, our founding story. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who will say that, you know, recession is the best time to start a company. And I couldn't agree more. It's funny. I started my career way back when Raising money from SoftBank in the best of times, right? Valuations were crazy. People were selling after you. You're just, just silly stuff. In the market crash, right? Completely ripped out from underneath us as a business. Uh, and way back then, we just changed business models twice, get new funding, recaps. You name the, the mess of what not to do from a venture standpoint, right? That was the time. But for any organization, uh, and whether you're thinking about individual choice to start a business or a government, whether you're encouraging people to start businesses, now is the time, right? The data actually shows right? Nearly 60% of the Fortune 500 were started during a recession, right? And that's a relative minority of years that we've had in the past since the 1800s. So if there's a time to do it, right now is the time. And so for me, it was a, it was a no-brainer, right? This is the time to jump in. It's, it's not going to get, frankly, much worse than this. And so there's only upside to be had in building something new. So that's my mm. Cool. Thank you. Um, so Heather, Heather Pace Clark has an international background educated in the US and Europe, and she's currently a co-founder of Galytics, which is based in Switzerland, which she described to me as uh, the Google Maps that helps energy and engineering companies find the best route for power lines and other infrastructure, and then do it in seconds instead of months. Uh, and before that, she held policy and communication roles at the World Economic Forum, Orange Telecom, and REC Solar, among others. So Heather, you too have been in the trenches scaling your startup during a pandemic. Um, what were some of the challenges and opportunities in terms of funding, client acquisition, et cetera? Anything that surprised you in particular? Well, I would say uh, the most exciting and surprising thing for us is that there's gonna be an increased investment in trillions put into infrastructure projects, which is a huge opportunity for us, both in Europe and the US. Our most exciting achievement during the whole experience was closing our seed round. So we really learned mm -hmm. that uh, there were fewer geographical boundaries when it came to acquiring investors. So we were able to really build a network globally much more easily than would have been possible before and to get that round closed. But we were also able to acquire new clients in South America and Asia, a big surprise because they needed to plan infrastructure remotely and to continue to collaborate with their teams, stay at home and do this instead of going out into the field. So it was great to see how we could empower them. And we would have never imagined that that would have been possible during such a, a critical phase. Mm, so many silver linings. Yeah. Um, OK. Uh, and then Gregory. Gregory Bedrosian has co-founded two independent investment banking firms, as well as a $1 billion private equity investment firm. And Gregory also has an international background. He spent half his career in Europe, half in the US, and currently he's managing director at Drake Star Partners, which is one of the global investment banking firms he co-founded, and it specializes in technology, media, and communication center uh, sectors. And from what I could see on the website, you've executed over 370 cross-border M&A and private equity transactions across the US, Europe, and emerging markets. Yeah. Um, so your investment banking firm works with companies that are, are more established in the later stages of their growth. And I saw some of them are in sectors like mobility and sports that were uh, directly impacted by COVID. So what were some of the trends that you saw and did you change some of your investment theses along the way? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And um, 
you know, I'll, maybe a, a couple of examples because the companies that we tend to work with are a little bit still growth stage, but a little bit later stage. And they're looking at either private equity financings or maybe even to sell the business um, itself. And certainly as some of the other panelists have come, we did see within this whole tech ecosystem, a really big acceleration of a lot of um, of these businesses. So founders and boards had to deal with, in many cases, growth ahead of their budgets, um, capital needs beyond what they had originally planned for, and talent needs beyond what they had originally planned for. And so in some senses, um, while other other sectors and other parts of society were reeling, many of these tech and tech-enabled businesses, as the panelists have pointed out, were really growing and transforming. And that's where we at Drake Star really, I think, came in and and helped and, and assisted. I, I, I'll start actually, though, with an anecdote from internally. We have nine offices across the U.S. and Europe. And when COVID started hitting in Europe and then rolled into the U.S. in the March time frame, um, I actually took a, a page out of my um, Harvard Business School playbook on agility that you commented on earlier um, and said, let's set up. We didn't know what we, was going to happen. Were deals going to freeze up? Were, you know, was business just going to come to a, a screeching halt? So we created literally weekly global partner meetings where all of us got on Zoom videos and just talked. And some of it was business, but some of it was just talking about what was going on in their life because they wanted to share that early on in the in that. We also had at the local level daily Zoom meetings with the teams. And in one sense, if someone had said, well, Greg, let's all mobilize and really communicate on video, you know, multiple times a day and globally, you know, once a week, I would say, wow, that's overkill. And in reality, it, it not only was essential, but I think really reinforced our own firm's corporate culture and fabric of our culture. Um, and we've actually since grown the firm during this era, hiring probably another 20% of our of our talent base, many of whom we recruited without ever meeting them in person, but we're now that COVID's loosening up, just starting to meet them. So I think that agile management strategy and approach and really being flexible and over-communicative was a success for our own firm. Um, as it relates to companies that, you know, that we work with, there, there are many, many examples. I pick up on one within the digital media economy. One of the big trends that we've seen in a number of companies we're working with are in the whole, what I would call, democratization of content creation. So many, many in the audience are probably familiar with the, the one of the new unicorns, Canva, this Australian business. It's now a $15 billion business. Um, it's a 10-year-old company um, that has just grown enormously. Why? Well, in the last 18 months, Content creators, whether they be full time or part time, had a lot more time to be at home and a lot more time to share, whether it be their creative ideas, their their templates, etc. Well, that business is fantastic. But what we've seen as a firm is a whole ecosystem of businesses in and around that, whether it be marketplaces to connect those talent creators, marketplaces to allow content creators who maybe have a full time job to have a side gig where they're putting out maybe some of their more creative or cutting edge um, um, ideas out on some of these platforms. And I think those are elements where it, it's not only creating new businesses and yes, whether it be millions or billions of value in companies, but I think it's also mobilizing a different part of the brain and the different part of the talent of society. I mean, this is something where there's you know innate creatives sitting there in jobs where they wouldn't call creative that are now mobilized. And so that's just a more societal trend that's just personally fascinating to me and to our firm. And we've certainly worked with many promising companies in and around that. Mm. So those are just a few examples. I love that take, Gregory. It's like there was all this untapped potential just in people, right. in, in society, this creative potential. And now they had an opportunity to actually explore and access it. And we need companies that can help them do that. I know the online course world, for example, has exploded as people have taken just their little piece of expertise and turned it into an online course. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, the first round. Uh, does anyone have any comments on, on what others have said? And you went first. Maybe you heard something that you'd love to jump in on. 
Yeah, I think the Canva story is a really good story uh, for all entrepreneurs. Uh, Gregory mentioned it's a 10 year old company uh, and it, its moment just happened. I mean, it has been well managed, growing nicely. Um, and also it then exposes a whole ecosystem. Uh, this is really true of most entrepreneurs is they are in it for the long haul. Uh, you know, Zoom was not a two year old company. It was, it was a two year old, almost two year old public company. Uh, but it takes a while for companies to really find their moment, especially ones that are venture funded. We anticipate that a company will probably go public now when it's about 10 to 12 years old. Uh, that's a long time. We see our CEO's uh, children grow up during that time. <laughs> Gregory also, also mentioned collaboration among the companies. Uh, the, one of the secret sauces, as we call it, in uh, software companies is that they've had to fight for talent for quite some time. Uh, and the software talent is distributed and scarce. Uh, so that made them distributed companies quite some time ago. So the concept of how do you collaborate with your stakeholders, your customers, your employees, really has been a problem we had to solve quite some time ago, uh, meaning that we're the, this is why these tools like WebEx, Zoom, et cetera, existed pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, and better tools even exist today. But it is really one of the challenges that companies will face if whether you're an entrepreneur or an innovative large company, how you really manage talent, especially the scarce technical talent you're going to need throughout your organization to be successful. What our companies had a big challenge with in the last 18 months is most companies have what they call the meetup, meaning once or twice a year, everybody becomes physically present maybe for a week at a time to get everybody on the same page of strategy, to see everybody physically, uh, to have different types of innovation exchanges happen. And that was not possible during COVID. This was very challenging for distributed companies. So even as a distributed company, you will face a challenge of, of, of not just managing on, on a virtual basis, but managing uh, in a in a closer collaborative basis. Mm, thank you. So so that begs the question then for Heather and Nicholas perhaps. What are some of the challenges you have in in finding talent? You have very sort of technical businesses, um, and then are working distributed. Maybe having never met some of your your team. I'm curious how you're handling that. Um, Heather, yes. Uh, well, I can say that I used Canva yesterday, so that's a great mm -hmm. way to not have to hire the same level of design resources. But we have actually built up a really good team. So we've put our developers all in one country. In our case, they're in Spain. And we've built around uh, a really good university with strong expertise in spatial data, mm -hmm. which is the core of our product offering. So I think leveraging those kind of university networks to build teams quickly in the right locations cost effectively has worked really well for us. So we're very happy with the results. And then just encouraging the, the kind of ongoing collaboration. In our case, we had a monthly beer just to catch up and share best practice to make everyone feel included. Those kind of community events have really been key with our clients as well as with our with our employees. Mm, so that's a good point, plugging into the existing ecosystem instead of... Yeah, no, definitely. And for entrepreneurs like us, the, the European Space Agency, the universities are really critical to our growth. So they've really helped us. The European Union, yeah. the Swiss government, all of these institutions that um, have the resiliency to get through this kind of crisis have really helped us to get to the next level. And our local customers, I would also add, we really focused locally to go globally during this crisis. So we really got to know our existing clients that we've been working with for several years, nurtured those relationships to get great case studies that have helped us to scale globally. So focusing on the local ecosystem has also been key. And did you do more of that because of the pandemic? Or was that something you were already doing? Uh, no, of course we were planning on it, but then we had to do it even more. You know, it was just right. easier to, and I think this right. is good for all startups. You need to get some really good success stories there to scale. So really getting to know those local clients, their pain points, and then taking those global has really helped us. So Yeah. So that's an interesting point about how the constraints of the pandemic actually helped you focus and perhaps get, or, get better results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. 
Nicholas, do you have anything to add? Sure. So, uh, you know, in our non privacy check, uh, we are, gosh, in Singapore and in India and in Detroit <laughs> already. They oh, were, wow. Um, and it's good. We've got a team that worked together before at WealthX where before, I mean, as you said, this technology has been around for a bit. We had 13 offices back then kind of everywhere. And so we never really had a headquarters. And so we have a different mission with privacy check. Our objective is to build not only a great company, but also help drive some economic resurgence in the Detroit and Michigan area more broadly. Mm. And so our challenge, I think, mostly is around importing talent and also capturing the talent that's there in Michigan as well, around uh, artificial intelligence mostly. The issue is, when you think about AI for our kind of business, you know, Michigan's heavily automotive, right? Uh, and there are a great number of, of automotive startups, if you will, Rivian and others that are pulling in the talent. So of the available AI talent that's there and the universities like U of M and other places, um, there's just not enough, right? And so our focus is how do we create a compelling employee story where people want to move to Michigan? I think COVID and the pandemic has helped in that people have been questioning where they want to live, right? In San Fran or New York or other major centers or make a move to the Midwest with the weather and the snow and the rest, right? But we're having success so far and people who are looking at making that move. Um, but that's going to be our ongoing challenge is we'll have not fully remote, right? Not people scattered everywhere, but a few major centers and for those centers, can we either build or import enough talent in those locations to be successful? So that's what we're working on right now. Hmm, that's interesting. So you had more of a lo- local focus as well because of the- We did, but I'd say also, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, we focus on speed as should every entry, getting it right, but also speeds. We love the global model, right? We love the ability to pass work around the world and keep moving. And so, you know, we don't have commutes like we did anymore, which is great. We can do follow the sun. So I think for, for maximum efficiency, this is us. We love the way that things work right now. We want to keep that going. Right. And what I've seen with some of my clients is because people have this freedom to work remotely, some of them are going back to where their families are, even if they're other, not you know, otherwise so-called desirable, but if their family is there, their community is there. Yep. So that might be a way to get people back to some of these places where they grew up. Yep. There's a lot of Detroit... I shouldn't say returnees of their, of their potential. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious then for, for anyone here, or maybe specifically Gregory and Anne to start, has the events that we've been living through, has that changed what you look for in terms of leadership? Are there things now that you're prioritizing in a way that you haven't before? Really curious. And we've mentioned resilience, uh, but perhaps emotional intelligence this ability to be agile? Sure. I mean, yeah, just to kick off, I mean, what I would say is I think um, all of that has always been, you know, key to evaluating entrepreneurial leadership. What I would say is sort of, you know, the the, the COVID environment has really amplified it and accelerated Mm -hmm. that. And, And I think it also puts that, in the forefront of one of the key screening items that that we as an organization that investor community ultimately when companies looking to exit the 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 big large cap buyers all all look to i think the other element around leadership though and this is a theme that i think continues to pick up on some of the points um you know and made and i started with the canva idea of, of enabling you know, a different side of one's brain or, or whatnot. I think even within the finance community, whether it's the venture capital community, the private equity community, the investment banking community, typically um, that has pulled from, frankly, a very finite, sadly, universe of whether it be universities or people must live in certain cities, whether it's mm-hmm. the Bay Area or New York or in Europe. London and a few other tech hubs around the world, right? Um, what we've seen in the COVID environment, both both for our own firm and I think other other peer organizations, is that democratization of where one lives, where one grew up, where one's studying, and we're able to interview and bring in talent that isn't necessarily living on one of the two coasts or living in a big tech hub in Europe, but is has the talent and the interest in being part of the, again, whether it's the venture, private equity, or investment banking communities. And I think now more than ever, those individuals have access to that interview process and a shot more so than they certainly would have several years ago. And I certainly hope that continues even as we reemerge from um, this environment. That's been something 
that we've seen as a positive impact for our own organization, actually. Yeah, that's a great point. It's really opened up that, that field. Yeah, and Yeah, one thing I would add is we have two entrepreneurs on this panel who are clearly extraordinary communicators. Uh, and that is uh, basically table stakes to really be a great leader. Uh, we've talked about talent extensively here and the competition for it, not just among startups and private companies, but now amongst between you and your customers almost who mm -hmm. have to be in the same business as you are. So the ability to attract excellence is really, really key for the leadership teams that, that we fund. And we've seen a, a much stronger element come in for that attraction of, of excellence and attraction of talent. And that is a very, very clear mission statement on the part of the companies. Uh, not just product descriptions, but you know, what are you going to accomplish if you are a successful company? Uh, and it's, we're not talking about, you know, I will sell 1 million of these products. Really, what is your impact? Uh, because great talent has many choices, and they are choosing impact as much as they are choosing products that they'd like to build if you're a software engineer or if you're a salesperson or if you're a marketing person or a finance person. So it really requires entrepreneurs to come to us even when they're getting their A round, and we, we are usually the first venture investors in a company. Uh, we've been the first venture investor in 200-plus companies over the last 30 years. You have to not just come in and explain the features and functions of breakthrough capability you're going to deliver, but the impact you're going to make as you build that company, because that's what you need to attract talent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I'll add on to that, just uh, something that's a challenge for us. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention sort of an increasing intentional uh, diversification of talent, whether it's big tech or startups. There's a real movement toward inclusivity in a way that I don't think has been around really certainly in the pandemic before, at least in my view. And I think as we look at building our company and recruiting talent, right, that talent being recruited heavily by the Googles, the Amazons, as you think about the workforce of the future, being more reflective of society, we too have to compete for talent, right, along those lines, attract those same people to come work for us, right, and work with us, because we too want to have an inclusive and diverse workforce that represents the customers that we serve. So I think that's, you know, we'd be remiss we didn't cover that today or mention that somewhat as well. There is a big push for having a more inclusive workforce more than ever. Mm -hmm. Making it an actual metric as, as you're recruiting? How for do you do us, that? yes, we're trying to be very intentional about that because I think even in this early stage, we've identified some biases on uh, perhaps how we think about consumer privacy uh, in ways and assumptions we shouldn't have made, right? And so, you know, early on, right, we're trying to be intentional about that. Um, but yes, I've heard, you know, uh, other investors talk about, uh, are they looking at diversity numbers in their ranks? Are they doing any analysis reporting? I think it's somewhat early stages, but seemingly heading that direction. Nice. Yeah, I can just say that that's certainly a trend we heard from U.S. investors that hopefully is coming to Europe. I would also say that our mission is to accelerate the energy transition. So we see a lot of our workers are really excited about that. And that's why they choose us over maybe a, a higher paid position. So um, that's definitely an important part of our story and getting mm. on board. Yeah, I think if you look at any uh, report on millennials and, and younger, mm -hmm. they're, they're very focused on meaning and purpose in the work mm -hmm. they're doing, how they're spending their lives every mm -hmm. day. Yeah. And that's true for the corporations we work with as well. They're keen to work with a startup to make their processes more agile, to introduce new technology uh, to, to really grow but they also want to be more mission driven. So I think that's also mm. an interesting and transition we're seeing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, interesting very, good very much. People, almost every resume we get, there's someone who has a very active social justice streak, which mm. a little bit surprising, in, frankly, in some ways, but you know, happy to see it. Mm. Yeah. And I think one other topic that was mentioned earlier is we learned, uh, and our, our companies learned, the value of customer. And at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when it was unclear whether procurement of anything would begin again, uh, people really got closer. To it. Cus companies got much closer to their customer. And that relationship was not just a technical relationship. It was uh, 
you know, closer to is their pricing strategy still valid uh, during what might become economic challenges during the pandemic? Um, how could they better serve that customer to keep their business more operational? And that was a key learning thing for everyone is what if you only had the customers you had today? Uh, are you, have you not only gotten them to be successful with your product, but do you really understand the strategic advantage you're bringing? Are you continuing to bring that strategic advantage? Will you continue to be a value to that customer? There was a real tightening of the customer company relationship uh, during the pandemic itself. Uh, and lo and behold, of course, that came forward in better products as new customers were forward. Mm. Wow, I really like what's emerging here because as I started off, we, we had these competing demands between performance and human well-being. And what I'm hearing you saying is that there's this very real focus now on, on actual people, whether it's just connecting with the people in your, your own company, whether it's uh, hiring people who are, are aligned with your mission, your, your customers, the people who are actually using your products. So as a global trend, a macro trend, that just that seems very, very heartening to me. Um, so I want to let everyone know who's, who's listening in. If you have a question, uh, I, I'll give you a chance to, to ask that. Uh, in the meantime, I'm curious, panel, if you could share one opportunity for people to, to you know, think about or to, to focus on as we move forward, what would, what would that be? I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Please. Um, and it's the other side of our, our business at Privacy Check, but shockingly in this increasing digital world where we uh, oftentimes are remote, identity, the concept of identity is still very much broken, whether it's in the U.S. or other locations around government. It's just that notion of, and I was at Equifax, right? I was there for the breach, right? Before, during, and after. And so this notion that the social security number is our unique identifier is just ludicrous, right? It's so dated, it's okay. insane. And so there's got to be a better way for us to think about consumer identity moving forward. There are ways people are working on it, but that's so far from solved. So if there's one opportunity, I'd say, which we're not working on, but maybe we will one day, uh, that's the one I, I point to, the idea, if you will. Right. And to me, that's that's just a, a bigger trend, how we keep using things, even though they've outlived their usefulness or whether they make sense anymore. Absolutely. And that's, that's a challenge for individuals, corporates, government, all the above, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully government's listening in too. Yes. Yeah. Challenging some of those conventional beliefs. Who else? Gregory? Yeah, I think um, picking up on some of the themes, uh, one, one thing that resonates with me is this acceleration of lifelong learning. And education was already in the process of being disrupted. I think um, COVID accelerated that um, at, the, at the institutional level. But again, I think some of the themes that we were talking about here at the personal level, because it does need to be individually driven, this concept of, you know, one goes to university, one picks a field, maybe goes to graduate school, and then they're working for the next X decades. Uh, that's already started to break down. I think it's really going to continue to break down and moving into different fields, gaining expertise much later in life um, and applying a second or third or fourth career opportunity, whether it's for financial gain or for fun or to help society. Um, I think all of that will evolve um, and this notion of being educated Will, will remain a lifelong element. And some of the tools and technologies that emerged in COVID will be enablers for that as well. Mm. Yeah, I so agree. I think, you know, you're going to learn something in college and then a few years later, it just might not be relevant or, at, or it might be obsolete. But from my point of view, it's more about learning that, that core skill. So if you're someone who repairs cars, for example, maybe you're not going to be repairing cars anymore, but you're repairing something. It's more that mindset, that ability to figure out problems. And I think that's what we need to be teaching people in school. Yeah, I would add uh, that, um, well, the core software industry is on fire. There's tremendous opportunities in everything from DevOps to 
core infrastructure software to security, et cetera. But we really are seeing more investments by venture capitalists in what we call verticals in what have been laggard industries. Education is a good example. We saw Coursera find their moment in time and finally go public. Uh, and that's a really, really symbolic offering in the educational space relative to what Gregory describes. We are seeing energy being looked at as a opportunity for innovation, although it may be more capital intensive than a traditional software company. Healthcare has been another laggard for automation, and hopefully that has leaped years ahead, uh, especially as a user of analytics and even core platforms. So what we really are seeing is some of the verticals that venture capitalists never focused on that look too hard. Government, education, utilities, healthcare, uh, being as exciting as fintech has been in the last two years. So I would encourage entrepreneurs that aren't core software developers where we invest to really look at where innovators can make an enormous difference because there's tons of capital around right now. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there's probably more capital mm -hmm. around today than there's ever been. And it doesn't mean that the capital is going to take more risk than it does, but it means it is capable of taking on uh, bigger opportunities mm -hmm. at the beginning. Mm. And I would just say, don't be afraid of big data. So you don't have to be a software developer to be able to benefit from it in your business. So just pilot it, try it. And if you have an idea, get the capital to just get started and don't be afraid to fail because it's too much fun to, to learn in the process. Yeah, there's just a, an abundance of opportunity is what I'm, I'm getting from all of this. Um, so there's, if we can answer Ananda's question, he's asking about strong teamwork virtually. Uh, what would be an effective team engagement to maintain motivation and driven for purpose? So this is going back to the idea of, of people are looking for meaning and purpose. Anybody have thoughts on that? How do, how do you, uh, you know, Gregory, you mentioned just having conversations. Yeah, well, I think it, start, it starts with just the openness at a simple level, right? But fundamental level, that openness and that frequency of communication that allows um, individuals who all come from different backgrounds, different views on what it's like to share ideas um, and growing up in different cultures and different parts of the world to start that conversation. So I think that framework itself is a really important fundamental starting point. Uh, but I'm sure some of our mm. entrepreneurs on the panel have um, some other concrete examples to, to, to reply to that question as well. well. We use Slack, so it's great to just give kind of uh, feedback quickly to the team. And then also just to give examples of how they're helping clients. Um, that's actually really cool to give concrete examples. So for example, today we were able to integrate more climate change data into our solution, and that's really exciting for our development team to see that they were able to, to be part of that. Ah. So real examples and sharing it fast and easy uh, via those channels, really quite cool. Oh, wow, that's a great point, Heather. So just actually letting them know, you guys did all this work, and here's what we were able to do. Here's what our, our customers were able to do. Close that feedback loop for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. seems, seems kind of obvious, but I, I know we get busy and we don't do things like that. Exactly. Yeah. So I would just share, uh, in addition, right, uh, the foundational communication, great, right, have to do those things. Um, everyone's motivations are different, so really getting to know each person. We're big believers in uh, behavioral uh, assessments and analytics to know what really motivates people. Um, but taking it a step further, I think, you know, this pandemic has, you know, frankly allowed us all to have a view into one another's homes, right? I presume we're mostly hoping. Literally. And no employee exists in isolation, right? They're part of a family uh, friends, right? They're, they're in that role for some reason. And so having that context, knowing what they're really about, right? And taking the time to really understand who they are as a human being, and then to figure out what motivates what gets them excited, how they want to contribute, right? What they want to see as success matters a lot, right? And that's goes back to finding talent and leaders and management who do that. But really, you know, look, we're all humans. And I think if anything, the last year and a half has taught us is, is know this. I've seen more kids of business partners and friends and the rest than I ever thought I would, which is great. I love it. We've all seen running around in the background, but it's knowing your people really, really well. Wow. I think that's a great note to end on. Unless someone have something to add. 
Yeah, just adding one thing. Uh, we found, uh, especially for small companies, uh, when we had our CEOs meet up once a week virtually uh, during the pandemic, that it was healthy for companies to hear new voices, not just their current CEOs all the time or their current leadership team, but to bring in other leaders. Uh, it, this was especially true as the dynamics changes from just a pandemic to, you know, uh, a massive racial crisis, including with our companies that were specifically located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So new voices made a very big difference here. The voice of the customer itself, not just telling about the customer, the voice of another CEO, the voice of a collaborator, really helps expand the dialogue amongst your smaller teams. Wow. So again, that theme of being inclusive and, and less of the hierarchy and really